Sauron's form casts a permanent and menacing shadow over the genre of high fantasy. Yet, his physical appearance remains little more than a silhouette in the darkest corners of our imaginations. In this video, we will remove his mask and discover the true essence of his terrible countenance. Within the lore that paves the way for the Lord of the Rings, a fascinating fact emerges. Sauron once possessed the powers of a shapeshifter. We learn of this mystical ability within the Silmarillion as Sauron is ensnared by Huan, the Hound of the Valar. But no wizardry nor spell, neither fang nor venom, nor devil's art nor beast strength could overthrow Huan of Valinor, and he took his foe by the throat and pinned him down. Then Sauron shifted shape from wolf to serpent, and from monster to his own accustomed form, but he could not elude the grip of Huan without forsaking his body utterly. Huan released him, and immediately he took the form of a vampire, great as a dark cloud across the moon, and he fled, dripping blood from his throat upon the trees. Yet amidst his myriad of forms, there were those he favoured, those he wore as second skin. Myron was Sauron's original name. Myron dwelled long on the island of Almeron in the early days of creation. In that hallowed land, he walked the path of Amaya under the tutelage of Aule the smith. All we know for sure about Myron's appearance at this time is that he would have taken a masculine form. Maiar bore distinct genders, and Sauron, in his essence, was male. Though the annals of lore offer no detailed description of his form, through countless iterations of artistic impressions, a figure has emerged. Clean-shaven, with strands of crimson cascading like rivers of flame, a reflection of Myron's essence in hues of passion and power. Yet, it is important to note, these depictions are not based on any textual evidence. During Myron's presence as a Maya on Almoran, his fervent longing for order caused him to cast an admiring gaze upon Melkor, the original Dark Lord. The allure of Melkor's brutal efficiency captivated Myron, leading him astray. With a heart swayed by ambition, Myron pledged fealty to Melkor, kneeling in subservience before the Dark Lord, thus cementing his role as his paramount lieutenant. In the beginning of Arda, Melkor seduced him to his allegiance, and he became the greatest and most trusted of the servants of the enemy, and the most perilous, for he could assume many forms, and for long, if he willed, he could still appear noble and beautiful, so as to deceive all but the most wary. Thus, with a new identity embraced, the shedding of the former mantle of Myron was inevitable, for the name Myron translates to the Admirable. Therefore, the Sindar Elves bestowed upon him the name Gorthawur, meaning Dread Abomination. Meanwhile, amongst the High Elves, the name Sauron took root, a disdainful mockery of his original name, meaning the Abhorred. Sauron ascended to rule over the stronghold of Angband, a fortress teeming with dreadful beasts and malevolent beings awaiting his command. In order to fulfill his duty, he would have likely felt compelled to adopt a visage suited to his newfound dominion. Sauron was become now a sorcerer of dreadful power, master of shadows and of phantoms, foul in wisdom, cruel in strength, misshaping what he touched, twisting what he ruled, lord of werewolves. His dominion was torment. Before long, however, his new master was overthrown by the Valar. In the aftermath of the cataclysmic War of Wrath, Melkor was shackled and cast into the endless expanse of the Void. Sauron, fearing judgment and retribution, fled from the Valar, seeking refuge in Middle-earth. Here, he waited patiently, crafting his machinations with careful deliberation. During his time as Myron, Sauron's hands wrought marvels beneath the tutelage of Aule the Smith as he delved into the secrets of arcane craftsmanship. Thus, with a heart twisted by malice and ambition, he now envisioned the forging of the rings of power, potent artifacts to bind and ensnare the hearts of the immortal elves, bending them to his dark will. Thus, in a guise of beguiling splendor, he appeared before the unsuspecting elves of Eregion, Claiming to be named Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, he whispered honeyed promises and spun tales of divine favor. 
ensnaring their trust and coaxing them to aid him in his sinister endeavor. Sauron should be thought of as very terrible. The form that he took was that of a man of more than human stature, but not gigantic. In his earlier incarnation, he was able to veil his power, as Gandalf did, and could appear as a commanding figure of great strength of body and supremely royal demeanor and countenance. Let us imagine Anatar as a figure of striking fairness and strength, embodying regality in a form befitting the title Lord of Gifts, as if a divine messenger sent to grace Middle-earth with his presence. Yet his true power was concealed in this modest guise. After Anatar had assisted the Noldor elves in the creation of the Rings of Power, he embarked on a journey to Mordor. It is conceivable that, at this juncture, he would have now shed the visage of grace, along with the name of Anatar, in favor of a darker, more powerful form. Tolkien does not specify if Sauron changed his appearance at this time. However, he did take on a new name after returning to Mordor, which likely indicates a change in form. Yet in the end, all this bliss and betterment turned to evil again, and men fell, as it is said, a second time. For there arose a second manifestation of the power of darkness upon earth, and whether that was but a form of the ancient or one of his old servants that waxed to new strength is not known. And this evil thing was called by many names, but the Eruhil named him Sauron, and men of Middle-earth named him mostly Zigur the Great. And he made himself a great king in the midst of the earth, and was at first well-seeming and just, and his rule was of benefit to all men in their needs of the body. For he made them rich, who so would serve him. But those who would not were driven out into the waste places. It is around this time, at the cracks of doom, that Sauron forged the Master Ring. And the first time that Sauron slipped the ring onto his finger, a shiver ran through the hearts of the elves, a chilling realization dawning upon them. They had been deceived. Thus ignited the War of the Elves and Sauron. Through the ebb and flow of battle, Sauron's darkness clashed fiercely against the light of elves and men. Yet, amidst the chaos, a reckoning loomed on the horizon, as Ar-Pharazon, the proud king of Numenor, dared to stand against the shadow. Ar-Pharazon the Golden was the proudest and most powerful of all the kings, and no less than the kingship of the world was his desire. He resolved to challenge Sauron the Great for the supremacy in Middle-earth. So great was the might and splendor of the Numenorians that Sauron's own servants deserted him, and Sauron humbled himself, doing homage and craving pardon. Arpharazon then bore Sauron across the sea. Thus, Zigur the Great came to the island realm of Numenor, ripe with feigned humility. Upon that ship which was cast highest and stood dry upon a hill, there was a man, or one in man's shape, but greater than any, even of the race of Numenor in stature. And it seemed to men that Sauron was great, though they feared the light of his eyes. To many he appeared fair, to others terrible, but to some evil. It is clear from this passage that the form which he takes in the Second Age is not the same as the Dark Lord form we all know from the Third Age. This Second Age form, though retaining a semblance of terror and malevolence, bears an allure to certain beholders. Thus, envision him in this time as a figure of beguiling looks, towering in stature, exuding power, and cloaked in an aura of foreboding. Zigur's ascent from captive to confidant was swift, his influence infiltrated the king's thoughts and seduced the minds of his people. With whispered promises of eternal life, he guided the monarch into rebellion against the divine order, urging an assault upon the sacred shores of Valinor. And so, Eru, the supreme deity himself, was stirred into wielding the fury of the seas, dragging Numenor beneath the waves. The mighty fleet, too, was consumed by the wrath of the sea. Amidst the chaos, Zigor stood within the Temple of Melkor. Ensnared in the tempest's fury, his body was broken by the cataclysmic flood. Yet his essence endured, a faint echo of malice that fled back to the lands of Middle-earth, bearing the scars of defeat. He was robbed now of that shape, in which he had wrought so great an evil, 
so that he could never again appear fair to the eyes of men, and came back to Middle-earth and to Mordor that was his home. There he took up again his great ring in Barad-dûr and dwelt there, dark and silent, until he wrought himself a new guise, an image of malice and hatred made visible, and the eye of Sauron the Terrible few could endure. Sauron now presented himself as the Dark Lord. No longer able to conceal his true nature, his physical appearance from then on was a true representation of his mind. As the Second Age waned and the Third Age dawned, Sauron's sinister guise was now a part of him, a chilling reflection of his unfathomable essence, right up until his ultimate downfall. In the wake of Numenor's ruin, the resilient, surviving Numenorians forged an alliance with the elven High King, Gil-galad. Together, they waged war against the forces of Sauron, culminating in a siege upon the fortress of Barad-dûr. In a climactic showdown, Sauron emerged from his stronghold, ready to face his adversaries head-on. Elendil and Gil-galad, fearless in their resolve, confronted the Dark Lord. In the throes of combat, they ultimately triumphed over Sauron, yet their victory came at a heavy cost as both kings perished in the fray. In the following narrative, penned by Isildur, who dared to cut the ring from Sauron's hand, hints emerge of the Dark Lord's corporeal essence. It was hot when I first took it, hot as a gleed, and my hand was scorched, so that I doubt if ever again I shall be free of the pain of it. The ring misseth, maybe, the heat of Sauron's hand, which was black and yet burned like fire, and so Gilgalad was destroyed, and maybe with the gold made hot again, the writing would be refreshed. In this portrayal, we are told of the searing heat emanating from Sauron's hand, a burning so fierce that it consumes Gilgalad, leaving him scorched and lifeless. We are also told of the paradox regarding Sauron's hand, black yet scorching like flame. One would expect such heat to radiate a luminous glow, but Sauron defies this expectation with his darkened touch, hinting at a hand draped in otherworldly shadow. Sauron, now bound in his Dark Lord form, bears a mark of eternal torment. The void where Narsil's blade cut the finger from his hand remains. Such truths are spoken of by Gollum, a soul acquainted intimately with darkness, hinting at a sinister meeting between the tortured wretch and Sauron himself. Yes, he has only four on the black hand, but they are enough, said Gollum, shuddering. Thus, upon the battlefield, Sauron found himself separated from his ring and severed from material manifestation. In the absence of the ring, it would be around 1,000 years before he could once again take physical form. This has led to a common misconception among viewers of the Peter Jackson movies who are yet to read the books. Most are led to believe that throughout the War of the Ring, Sauron existed solely as a great eye perched atop Barad-dûr. Although the eye of Sauron does exist in the books, its essence is more metaphorical, a projection born of thought and will, symbolizing the ever-watchful gaze of Sauron, always searching for any he could influence from afar and carefully observing the unfolding of Middle-earth's destiny. In fact, in the year 1000 of the Third Age, around 2000 years before the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, Sauron would already begin to once again take shape in Middle-earth. Upon his re-emergence, he dared not reveal himself fully, for his strength was yet to bloom. Still, his essence permeated the lands of Middle-earth, casting a shadow that was felt by many especially among the wise and powerful. During this time, he became known as the Necromancer. Some here will remember that many years ago, I myself dared to pass the doors of the Necromancer in Dol Guldur and secretly explored his ways and found thus that our fears were true. He was none other than Sauron, our enemy of old, at length taking shape and power again. But the Necromancer's reign at Dol Guldur was fleeting shattered by the White Council's onslaught. Forced to retreat to the Sanctuary of Mordor, he now unveiled his true identity as the Dark Lord Sauron in all of his terrible glory. He was a titan among shadows, 
whose towering stature eclipses the tallest among men and elves. His form, shrouded in the deepest abyss of blackness, exudes an infernal heat that scorches the very air around him. His maimed hand bears the scar of Isildur's blade. Where once the ring nestled, now a missing finger reminds him of the shame of his defeat. His very presence infects the lands in which he dwells, creating a blighted wasteland where despair reigns supreme, where the very earth suffers under the weight of his corruption and death stalks the land. To stand before him is to court oblivion, to gaze into the abyss from which there is no return, for he is the embodiment of all that is wicked and vile, a dark lord whose very name strikes fear into the hearts of all who hear it. And then there is the eye, wreathed in flames, a window to the abyssal depths of his soul. His gaze pierces the veil of the mind, tormenting the soul and laying bare innermost fears. Yet, this was not truly his final form. With the destruction of the ring, Sauron makes his one and only appearance in the books. The realm of Sauron is ended, said Gandalf. The ring bearer has fulfilled his quest. And as the captains gazed south to the land of Mordor, it seemed to them that black against the pall of cloud, there rose a huge shape of shadow, impenetrable, lightning crowned, filling all the sky. Enormous, it reared above the world and stretched out towards them a vast, threatening hand, terrible but impotent. For even as it leaned over them, a great wind took it, and it was all blown away and passed. And then a hush fell. This vision is the truest form of Sauron, an impenetrable shadow. The image on screen now is a painting that Tolkien himself painted of this very moment. The last throes of Sauron before he disappeared forever into the wind. The fact that Tolkien dared to shroud the antagonist of his tale in such mystery is a testament to his genius. Sauron, a nebulous darkness, takes form solely through the deeds of those under his sway, rendering him a haunting spectre, all the more profound, expansive and ominous in his very absence. In this way, he looms larger and more formidable than any manifestation could have portrayed casting an unforgettable impression upon all those who encounter the tale of the Lord of the Rings. Thank you very much for tuning in to Realms Unraveled. Before I bid you a fond farewell, I would like to take this opportunity to light the beacons and call for aid. If you did enjoy this video, I would ask that you kindly click the like button below. Also, I would be very grateful if you would consider subscribing and clicking on the bell icon. By doing so, you will be notified when I upload new videos. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, farewell, fellow explorers of Middle-earth.